So welcome everyone to the Snunemu Culture Presentations by the Gabriola Arts Council. My name is Carol Ferguson. I'm the Executive Director of GAC and I am pleased to introduce uh, Bo Wagner, Canoe Carver, and Dave Bodily, Knowledge Holder, and they are going to do a presentation this afternoon about Snunemu culture. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our, um, would be our fifth, is, fifth in our series, has it been? We've been going for a couple of months here from November now till January. And I guess we have two more weeks of doing this too. So by the end of January, but um, uh, as a Snanemo member, I'm um, honored to help um, coordinate this and help um, recognize that we're in our territory of Snanemo here and our people have lived here for 10,000 years. And there's um, a lot of uh, connection to Gabriola Island. And I'm looking forward to this. So on behalf of Snanemo myself, recognizing welcome to Snanemo. We bring our hands in front of us and you shake them twice and say Haitschka, which means thank you in our language. So I, today we're going to talk, we'll let Bo talk about um, the fishing, what we're um, saying within our Salish area. And it seems like Bo and I were on the same thought when we brought our same book. We both have the same book we brought along to, to talk about <laughs> as our means area of talking. So, so well, without further ado, I didn't have any videos to start off today. So we'll pass it over to Bo and I'll let him start to introduce some of the work he has. Yeah, so I'm Bo Wagner and um... I'm a knowledge holder of uh, dugout canoes and uh, canoe carving. And so there's many, uh, can, the canoes are, were used not just for journeying, uh, journeying around and uh, um, traveling from one nation to another, but they're also used for fishing and uh, food storage. And uh, so, Today we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, the canoes were used uh, during that um, harvesting uh, the traditional foods here. And so I have a canoe behind me here. And so this is um, what would be used called as a canoe bowl, but it's uh, in just in the same shape as a traditional dugout canoe. And so this will be used for harvesting. And I have some cedar rope here as well. And so they would, um, the Coast Salish here would use uh, rope just like this to anchor down their canoes, but also to make fish nets from. And so there's uh, many photos of these canoes all lined up along the beaches for uh, when they would gather and have potlatches. And so I have a few photos in the book here that uh, depict these. So here's one. You can see it. Yeah, so you can kind of have a witness how that was. And so, <clears throat> and they also made hooks and so here's a, uh, some photos of a Bentwood box created in order to make the fish hooks. And so my papa would have me make these items to keep, uh, to share that knowledge with me so that I could carry it forward and teach the younger generations. And so we have traditionally it was made, nets were made from stinging nettle. We have some here. And then they used uh, maple to make thin, um, I think there's a picture of it in here as well, the fishing needles. And so I created many of these to make fish nets. And so I, um, the reason why I did that is so that he could, um, he wanted for me to know these knowledges to carry them forward and um, he told me uh, all those days of his family um, uh, Pierre uh, Samson Pierre and so his family got quite wealthy off of fishing in this territory and uh, he told me about the days of how they were able to fish and harvest 
and to um, carry these teachings forward from their ancestors. And so um, that was his hopes is that I would carry them forward for a new time. And so I have a, uh, a few pictures of the different nets that were made. And so each one of these stones, people have been finding them on the beach. And he showed me how to make nets just like this. And so there's a cedar rope that goes across the top and then the stone weights that are on the bottom that hold the fish net. And Dave has a story that coincides with this um, fish net. And so he talked about um, fishing in that same manner. And so it was neat to hear some of Dave's stories when um, my papa had very similar stories about getting up early in the morning, bathing, and then going on uh, his, and knowing all the tr traditional routes and where the fish would be during the certain times of the season. And so, yes, and then, so here's. <laughs> so these are some of the rocks that were gifted to me from Gabriola. There was someone had found it over on the island and these two were working together to saw things like the netting. When we need to cut it off, you would saw that on this here on the little piece. And um, these are gifted about um, just in the last year and they come back about 5,000 years. Um, there's a very exact same images are in the book called the Sinhalewitz people, which was written about the, um, the transfer of water between um, Mudge Island and Gabriola Island, because that was the area where that book was um, written about. But there's several different rocks that are all used according to what my elders had shared with me. And one of the stories was one of the rocks that was a very large um, rock that was found. Um, they had come to my uncle's house and asked if he was um, willing or interested in buying what this man told him was a mask. And it was a non First Nations man that came to this, our elder's house. And um, he, when he took, took the mask out and showed my uncle, it was a stone mask. And in the book, they're showing some of the images here that those were used for pounding the posts in into the ground in their in the estuary. And so it was quite common in Snanemo area in our estuary that these posts were pounded in for thousands and thousands of years. They've always been using them. And that um, man tried to sell the mask to my uncle, but my uncle said he um, couldn't buy anything like that. So it ended up being sold to the museum in Victoria and they have it on display in the museum. Um, but I believe there's more of a significance to it when there's an image carved on the rock and that goes back thousands of years that it wasn't just simply used as a post driver. Oh, the netting. There's different netting that's done along in a, in a row that's all along in the estuary. They recently removed, um, it was like a dike that was along the estuary. They had thought in the 50s that they would help. It would help in case the tide ever came up, but it didn't work and it was actually stopping the fish from getting into these um, uh, areas up the river. So they removed them within the last two years. And so I had I got, had the opportunity to be on the um, committee that was overseeing that work of how the how the water is uh, rejuvenating itself. The estuary is coming back to life. So and here's a picture of uh, oh, yeah, the, the canoes song. all along the beach. Yeah, the songies. Yeah, that's a great photo. And the Songhees was located right downtown Victoria, but um, around 1910 till 1911, they were moved to their present location. Um, when the Empress Hotel was built in downtown Victoria, it changed the atmosphere there. So it was, um, they felt at that time that it was best for the Songhees to move. But they had been in the inner harbor of Victoria for thousands and thousands of years. And there's a lots of uh, photos of them fishing and even um, having potlatches in those areas. And so my papa would always talk about his summers on Gabriola, and he showed me how to harvest ironwood to make these fish holders. And so him and his family would travel to Gabriola 
and harvest fish along the way in their canoes. And they would create, they would dry their fish for, their, for the winter and for uh, other gatherings within the nation. So I just thought that was an important piece, that connection between um, Sinemo and Gabriola. And the ironwood is also known as the ocean spray, and it grows um, around in our areas here, not as plenteous, but we know of it. And one story goes back when I was young, um, my uncle, my mom's um, uh, older brother, had said, it's time for us to go get some, um, some sticks for the salmon so we can smoke some salmon. So we drove out some fields behind his um, property in the back of his property and found the ironwood. And he showed me how to pull the branches down to separate the branches from the main stalk of it. And so after we collected all those main stalk, we brought those back um, towards to his house. And that's what he was using to um, put the, um, the salmon, open the salmon and those, those uh, branches wouldn't wilt in the heat and that was really good use for that. And so they still use that to this day because even though they're small, thin branches, they don't wilt or don't bend from the heat or anything and they stay in their shape and it helps hold the fish open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, here's some of the teachings. Here's some of the, the spears oh, that yeah. were used. So yeah, so some of the, um, uh, my papa got me to make multiple of these fish hooks. And um, so I, I'd get one finished and be like, okay, on to the next one. And I never got to see them in use. So it was good, neat to see the, uh, this book and how they're used. Um, he also got me to make these fish clubs. And we usually made this one, the third from the right there, or from the left, that one there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any questions about what we're asking? We'll guess, ask Carol to um, open up that if in case there's any thoughts or questions. We've got lots of different areas we can share about. Artist didn't come and join in, so. She'd say she's going to put some questions forward. <laughs> that happens. So that book that I was mentioning called The St. Hillowitz People was um, about that area there. And there's um, those same kind of hooks with the, um, the serrated edge on them that were found or several of them that were found out in that area there because it, they're used a lot of times with the fishing. And so those ones um, lasted. Some of them were over 2000 years old, the sticks, because they were made out of maple and they seem to be very strong, very hard wood. Here's a picture of a bass. So a lot of these images, um, when they um, prayed and they would ask for um, uh, guidance from their ancestors and they would get visions, they would carve on those stones and the pieces of wood. And um, that's what our old people say is uh, making the sacred visible. And so, oh, a lot of our beliefs is that when we put good energies into those that we would catch fish. And so, um, yeah, there's a good photo. Here's a good example of some of the, um, the ways they would dry fish from way back. Um, we haven't done that so much now. It's more in the interior. The people have done more of this kind of fish when you stretch them out. These have got to be um, Chinook salmon because they're so big <laughs> and you can see them. But um, the dogfish is one that really um, is easy to hold. It has a very strong spine in it. So when we um, stretch those out and, and smoke them, the sticks hold them really big. So they are really large. And also, so oh, it's backwards, but okay. it says spiritual realms. Oh, yeah, and yeah. so it's a lot of my teachings are about um, carving with a clean mind and uh, clear in your heart. And so when we carve, we always make sure that we're um, uh, clean and we're, um, we're open to those, uh, to that, uh, to the sacred things that might come to us in that time. I know there was two, two questions. There. Yes, we have two questions. Okay. So how is the netting made 
and was it all made with cedar? So the so there's a, a few parts to the nets that made them. I'll show you the picture close up of it. The center part here is the net. What it looks like when it's um, um, strung out because it's it kind of tries to go back straight the way it was originally, but there's knots that tie it and hold the pieces. So they're made according to the fish we're trying to catch so that the fish can't swim right through it. And they are made out of sting and nettle. And that's what we were sharing earlier here that this is the sting and nettle here. And I harvest that. We have a, a few week window to harvest it, the last two weeks of August and then the first week of September. And that's the only time we harvest that. And it's known that we collect the sting and nettle at that time. So, and I went out with an elder in Lummi, Washington, and he taught me how to uh, harvest this and how to make it into the netting to make the twine for it. And would it be possible for one of you in the chat to write out the title and the author of the book? Oh, oh, I can show it to you. You can see it right on the very front, but see it comes out backwards on our end. So I don't know, if, can you see that okay, Carol, or is it backwards? Um, move it over a little to the left. Yep, there we go. So Indian Fishing, oh, Early go. Methods of the Northwest Coast by Hillary Stewart. That's right, yeah. And this was the one that was done in 1974 was my copy and Bo has a newer version of it. Yeah, so that's what you find in the store now. Mm -hmm. I don't Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And okay. also the book in reference to the history of Mudge and Gabriola. Which book okay. was that? I'll slip back and I'll slip past Bo and I'll grab mine. <laughs> so I have uh, another. There's a. So it's called the sink. Yeah, it's usually in a. Okay. This was the one. This was the book that was published. Whoops, that's the picture that goes with it. Whoops, sorry about that. I was uh, scattered around. So this was um, published by the museum back in the, in the uh, mid 70s called the Sinhilowitz People. And it's the area that's, um, what's the name of that road that um, has a little boat dock that goes across the Mudge Island. There's a little road, San Carlo, or I can't remember the name, John Gabriola. But there's a little thin road that goes along South Road there, and it goes to a little boat launch that can go across the Mudge Island. And it was right in that area where they dug these artifacts up. And there's reference to several items like the, the stone I was showing earlier is in the same pictures are in here, the same kind of thing. But all these items had been put back into the ground. Um, I was part of the um, the um, project that brought those all back to Snanemo and then put them all back in the ground in 2001. Um, but let's see if I can see some more. More of them, it's talking about the arrowheads and whatnot that they dug out. And there's a lot of other information they um, put in here that doesn't refer um, to more about what we're talking today. But the Sinhilowitz people, it's no longer in published. It was published by the museum, I think in the early 70s. And then when we did the repatriation, we had asked that they no longer publish it anymore. So anyone who has a copy, that's one that you can't get anymore. Okay. Another question about uh, the nettles and how mm -hmm. strong they are. Was it used for other purposes besides fishing nets? Um, in the First Nations, I hadn't had knowledge other than that until recently I seen some people were carting it and it's where they stretch it between two uh, metal uh, teeth kind of thing and they strip it down and they break it down then they were using it to make some uh, fabric with it would be the very similar to hemp if someone was making something from hemp because it's a very uh, 
lots of strength inside the um, nettle. When it's in this dried state, it wouldn't be able to be we woven as easy, but when we wet it again, it would very easily be able to weave it. And then it dries similar to the cedar, it hardens up after it dries. I don't have much knowledge of other items that were made, but it would be interesting. I'll continue to search for that from our community too. Yeah, so I, I know there is one photo in here about the, so there's rope that goes across the top of the net. Yeah, that's right. And then the stinging nettle would all be woven in between and then with the stones hanging underneath. And then, so there's a picture of two canoes going up um, in between Gabriola and Mudge and they were hanging that net and, and uh, dragging it. And so it would, it was catching the, the salmon as they're running through. And then um, they pulled it up from the bottom. They had another rope from the canoe that went to the bottom of the net and would pull it up, making a like a bucket shape. And they pull it right up and they have another photo of a canoe right full. And uh, my papa would talk about how the um, there was sometimes the harvests were so plentiful that the canoe only one person could fit in the canoe with all the fish because it would just be right overflowing. And so that's, uh, it's amazing to hear some of those stories. And my uh, papa would talk about if you climb to the top of the, uh, the mountain, when the fish were running, you could, you could barely hear, if I was talking to Dave, you could barely hear me because, and we'd be on top of a mountain and I, you'd have to yell to hear me because the, all the Georgia Strait would be just boiling with uh, the the fish. And so it's just incredible to hear the, how much, um, how plentiful it was at that time. So one story I'll share with you. Um, is there another question, Carol? No? Not at this time. Okay. okay. So one other story I'll share with you was when I was 11 years old. Um, I was just a little child, but my, um, my uncle had asked that I come with him to come fishing in the Nanaimo River. And so I came to their house because I was raised in Port Alberni, but I came and stayed at their house. And so it was only around supper time. And he said, you have to go to sleep now because we have to get up in the middle of the night. So um, I off to went to bed and then I could hear someone in, in the middle of the night um, coming into my room and um, telling me it's time to get up and go to the river. And so my uncle was already ready. And so I got ready too with a coat on and boots. And we went down and he had a little coal lamp, that, like an oil lamp that he carried with us down this trail and went down to the edge of the river. And he um, told me to climb into the front of the boat. So I climbed over everything that was in the boat. It was a small, maybe about a 16 foot boat. And then I got to um, the front of it and then he pushed off with it and he had a little lamp in the center so he could see a little bit of glowing, but it was very dark, of course, in the middle of the night, there was no moon or nothing. And then um, I heard a big splash noise in the water and there was a beaver that was um, swimming in the water in the river. And um, I didn't know what it was and it kind of startled me, but he explained to me that it was a beaver that was swimming in the river. And so we got out to the Nanaimo River and it seemed like the tide was fairly high because it wasn't pulling. I don't remember us being pulled downstream. And so he paddled across the river and gave me a rope and told me to climb up to a tree and wrap the rope around that tree. And so I did and climbed up and hung on to that rope and I just waited right on top of that tree or just on the ground of it. And then he backed the boat back out into the dark and I could see the little lamp as it um, drifted further across the Nanaimo River. And I waited there and waited. And while I was holding on the rope, I could feel the rope tugging every once in a while because he had laid a net all the way across the river. And it was, it didn't seem like very long at all. And then he came back, <coughs> excuse me. And as it, as he came back across the river, he um, would take the uh, fish out of that net and put them into a big tub that he had in the boat. And by the time he got to me, he told me to unhook the um, rope off the tree and then climb back in. And then I could see all the fish and he had a whole like tub full of fish. And so he paddled back across the Nanaimo River and we have a little uh, kind of a creek that's on our side of the river. And we went back in that creek 
And once we got to the shore where we were at, where we came from, um, we both took each ends of that. And it was too heavy for me as a little child, but I kind of dragged it. And we pulled that toad along a trail that went to a smokehouse. And they used to have to keep a padlock on the smokehouse because there's other people would try and come into the smokehouse too. So he unlocked that there and we dragged the toad inside in and put it on the floor in the smokehouse. And he said, we're all done for the night now and I'll deal with these fish in the morning. So then that was the end of it. He locked it back up and we went. And so we, when we went back to the house, I just went back to sleep. But it's interesting for me to remember that experience at 11 years old. And now this is my 60th um, year this year, but a real honor to have bring back a story like that. So. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Visually imagining. <right? laughs> Any questions or comments? Did you go back to the smokehouse uh, with them in the morning? I can't remember that part. I don't know. I may have, but I don't remember. But I, I did go with them other times. And that's when we went out and harvested the um, ocean spray or the ironwood. And then we would use that to smoke the salmon on. So it might have been connected the same time. I don't remember um, the exact timing time frame. But I remember I was 11 years old. So would have been 40, 41 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Neat stories when we have that uh, experience on our land because it's been our family land, the little launch where we launched the little boat from and then we brought back the boat. It was the same um, place that my grandfather as well as my uncle would have brought their boats as well as my mom's bro other brothers, they would have brought their boats to that same shore as well as my grandfather and my great grandfather. So it could have been hundreds, if not thousands of years of using that same launch there. And it was very interesting because my grandfather was a canoe carver. So he would probably make all his own canoes when he was younger and then use those canoes for the fishing experience. So, but it was a neat adventure to, to go back and remember that one part of it for myself so I can carry that forward now. Yeah. I the first time I um a Papa was like uh, the, we're getting fish today it's time for you to learn how to carve a fish and so he he, he came in and there is uh over 20 food fish there and he said now it's time to learn now and so I uh, carved uh, <laughs> I started carving the fish and getting them they know that's all wrong <laughs> Awa. <laughs> Awa means no. <laughs> <laughs> and so he showed me how at uh, the fillet of the fish in the traditional way. And so I, I uh, started and I did all 20 of that day. And by noon I was finished and we, um, uh, we kept them in a, in a tub overnight. Um, uh, what do you call that? What do you, Brine them. Yeah, we brine them yeah. for overnight and then we put them in the smokehouse yeah. the next day. And after we hung them all in the smokehouse, um, I made little metal racks for them all to lie in. And so we had them push put over top of the fire and 20 more fish came in. And so I started the whole process over again. This went on for five days every day and my 20 more fish would show up. And by the end of the five days, we had over a hundred fish in that smokehouse. And I, um, I just remember for maybe about two weeks after that, every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was eating smoked fish. <laughs> and, and, so, and I really enjoyed that, um, having that time with him, eating with him and having his stories and, uh, Oh, it's time to go down the beach now and get me some oysters. Like, okay, Papa. So I'd take the wheelbarrow and walk up and down Shell Beach collecting oysters so that uh, Papa could have lunch. And so after we'd harvested all those fish and he showed me how to carve them all, he got me to take all the heads off and we'd make uh, fish head soup. And so after eating, after we'd have smoked fish, he would have 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 me uh, prepare the fish head soup. And so it was quite, um, I've never had anything like that before. And uh, it was, um, I really loved it. It was just like, I was expecting 
I wasn't expecting that flavor and it was really good. So I was um, really grateful that he opened me up to that experience and shared with me, shared, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So any of you that have um, ever um, seen the preparation for smoking fish or preparing the fish to be smoked, when we say we brine the fish, what we do is we have a salt and water mixture or salt and sugar mixture, and we um, would use brown sugar and we would um, uh, put portions of it together until it's mixed because it starts to dissolve once you put the sugar in the salt. And we would wipe that all over the fish and would smear all the fish with that and let it sit until it dripped off. So anytime you're doing that, it's always a mess on the ground around it. Mm -hmm. And then there was bees around it and everything. But we would um, brine all the fish and then it get prepared. And then we would take it on and smoke it in the, uh, in the smokehouse. When they're um, doing different kinds of smoke, like cold smoking the fish, um, someone has to stay there to keep the fire going all the time. And so my cousin and I, he said he would volunteer to stay 24 hours a day and keep the fire going. And the one that the smokehouse that I remember with him was um, the stove was outside the smokehouse and it had a long chimney that went into the smokehouse. And the smokehouse was airtight and it would just fill up with smoke. And there was little vents that he would open every once in a while to keep the um, the air circulating. So it seemed like it worked pretty good. So I went back a couple of days later and seen he was still set up there, and he had just been camping there all the time while the while the fish was being smoked. So it take, took about four days to get the fish all smoked. But it was a neat procedure to witness that myself. So. Oh, and I, um, that was my job, and so Papa would be like, okay. Every four hours, you got to stoke the fire and keep the green wood on it. And so, so we didn't use dry wood. We used green. Um, I think we used alder. Yeah, we used alder. Yeah, alder is alder. And uh, we had some maple as well. And so, but we kept it green so that that way it didn't um, didn't produce any flame. It just produced a lot of smoke. That's right. And we, he had a big barrel made by a fabricator. And so it was really low and wide and open. And so that barrel was actually placed right inside the smokehouse. And uh, we'd, um, I'd have to, I stayed awake for, uh, I think it was maybe about a week or something. <laughs> every four, every four hours going and stoking this fire. And yeah. I just reeked like uh, <laughs> smoke and fish and, it was <laughs> quite the experience. <laughs> Once you've experienced that that um, um, opportunity to do that, you don't ever forget that smell, that smell of smoked fish mm -hmm. or that smell of the, of the smoke from there. I did the same thing at my home in the city of Nanaimo here with a little uh, called a Big Chief Smoker. And it was a little smoker where I had determined I was going to do my own fish. And here was 10 fish I had smoked and sure had to do it all night and every four hours I had to add the more cedar to it and um, it just kept smoking and, and it worked and I had to keep rotating them and it was a good experience but I don't want to do that no more I'm too old, <laughs> too old now a young man's job yeah, yeah. Yeah. we have a question from Antoinette she said do you remember the recipe for fish head soup and what other ingredients went into it mm, good question yeah and so uh, traditionally they had had um, potatoes, carrots. Yeah, potatoes, carrots, and he had peas. Yeah. And sometimes um, turnips. Yeah, and turnips. Yeah. And uh, so I put the fish heads in and then they would be boiled um, until they were starting to fall apart. And then we'd pull all the bones out. Yeah. And then at that point, um, we had started adding all the vegetables. Yeah. And uh, so then that would all be cooked down until um, the broth got quite thick and the Onion, potatoes. Onions too. Yeah, and onions as well. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah so it yeah. was, um, I had, like I was saying, I had never had any, any uh, traditional foods like that before. And um, every day he was showing me something new and um, I'll always remember those times fondly and trying to remember them correctly so that I can carry them forward. And um, 
No, quite a chowder. No, no, it wouldn't be quite like a chowder. It was more like um, um, like a more of a liquid soup because when you boil the fish head, you can't have it so thick that they don't fall all apart. Um, the, when we scoop that out, there's always a brine or a base to the soup, but it wasn't like a chowder. I don't remember it ever being thick or creamy because I remember yeah, always no. be able to see the, um, the colors inside it. And that wasn't quite a um, uh, chowder. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Any other thoughts or comments about that? Because it's making me feel hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> I a comment from Ardeth. She said, "I'm on onions too." Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. We've always put that in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so awesome. I wanted to share a little bit more about the um, when we were talking about the netting that we put on the netting. We would use um, the rope, and the rope. Um, this is called a two-strand cedar rope. I also have here a small that's a three strand cedar rope and as I'm as I'm created it I can see where my errors where I made mistakes with it but each one I make I'll make it better and so I'll get better and better with that that's the smaller rope then this one here is a larger rope that's a two strand and you can almost see that it's been twisted too much because there's some broken pieces on it and frayed pieces. That's if we twist the rope or the cedar too much, it starts to break. So the rope isn't as really strong It's more for display purposes. And then I made another rope, which was a three strand rope, which I started to perfect the idea of that and started to see where I could improve on it. And this one is quite strong because one of these, if it was a length of it, could hold a, a big boat to the shore without any problems at all. These were also used when we had the nets because there's a smaller rope would go on uh, holding the net on the top of it like Bo was sharing. But this one here would hold the whole net together, um, holding it to the shore if need be, wherever we're tying it up. So always incorporating the cedar weaving into it. And this is something that's been taught to me many years ago. And it was um, just brought back to me last year. And I was really honored to sit with one of my Sinanemo cousins. And she um, taught me the, um, how to bring the rope in it. And it was there, but it just came back to me again. So it was neat to bring back that um, knowledge of it. When we made these larger ropes like this, this could be made into sometimes a headband too and we would have them as a, as a headband. When we're wearing the cedar, we've set, we, in our cultural belief, we, we wear it because there's strength in that and there's protection for us too. So we have a, a very um, important part of us, not just wearing it to be wearing it, to be wearing it for protection. And that's important in ours. I remember Papa telling me a story of, he made a rope or there was a rope that was stretched all the way across Shell Beach it was a thousand feet long. Yeah. And so they made a uh, rope like that for oh, yeah. all different kinds of purposes. So it's just amazing they, how much work went into a foot of rope and then the think a thousand feet yeah. is so amazing. <laughs> it's just yeah. amazing how Absolutely. far. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Are there certain yeah. times of the year when you harvest? The cedar for rope making is is oh, yes. absolutely absolutely okay. yeah any further part of that question or is that that's that's my oh. question <laughs> okay um yeah good question but um we usually uh, harvest the cedar um, for any of my work that i do between the may long weekend and canada day um, we've some people have gone out earlier and collected the cedar earlier in the year, but sometimes it's uh, sticky because the pitch is still running in the tree. And then that would be um, really uh, sticky when you're weaving it. You can boil the cedar to remove some of the pitch from it, um, but they um, um, it's better recommended that you do it after the May long weekend because then the sap has stopped running. If we drew, took it too late in the year into um, further past Canada Day into July, often the cedar trees are already starting to dry out for the summer and sometimes the, um, the cedar strips will just splinter off of the tree and they're not as usable the same. So it's always good to keep within those certain amount of times and then um, 
what why I've always in, was encouraged to share was that it's only a First Nations thing to do this. Um, we don't encourage other people to go out and and learn this and go out and do it on their own because um, we're always concerned for the living because if someone has not prepared themselves right, like Bo was saying, of having the right mind and the right spirit, um, there's harm can come to us. And so it's so important to be prepared from that very morning we wake up in order to go get that cedar and then go out and do it. So it's all prepared. We're, we're preparing in advance. So we don't just um, uh, do it to spare the moment to kind of thing. So good thoughts. And we prepare all year round. Mm -hmm. It's just like how uh, when it's time to harvest a cedar tree, I didn't just walk through that forest that first time and uh, decide that's the cedar tree. I went there the whole year beforehand and uh, and I talked to the land and I realized that uh, what animals and what plants were there and uh, what tree was out of place, you could say. And so we never um, go in and just take from the land. We're always trying to find a way as um, caretakers of the land from the top of the mountains to the bottom of the sea. It's our um, responsibility to carry those teachings forward so that our children and our future generations can have those same teachings. And so um, that's part of my responsibility as a knowledge holder to carry those teachings so that I can, um, like Dave was saying, uh, we're always so concerned for the living. And if we go out and um, if I share the wrong knowledge, um, that can come back on me. So I'm always very, um, mindful of that and um yeah a couple questions we have yeah, a couple. question yeah oh can you can see them obviously um where is <laughs> yeah, yeah. shell beach where is shell beach so shell beach is on the peninsula of um in ladysmith and so if you're at transfer beach you look across and um it's just kind of it's like south of cedar <laughs> And so if you're in Ladysmith and either a look across, you'll see a string of islands. And on the other side of those islands is Shell Beach. And uh, if you follow Breton Page Road, you'll end up on Shell Beach Road. And so if you go down onto, I can't remember what reservation it is. Um, I'm not sure either. Just Shell Beach. Yeah, it's just Shell Beach. And yeah, it's so all part of Staminas. The Staminas Reserve is five reserves, and uh, four of them are located in that area there, and then the other one's located in the town of Chimenas. Yeah. And Frida is asking, um, how do you select the trees, and does harvesting the cedar for rope damage the trees? That's a good question. We should see if we can find it on the other side of the flat piece of cedar. We'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, so selecting the cedar tree, um, we always say that not every cedar is to be harvested harvested from. Um, we could um, look through the forest, sometimes travel for uh, up to half an hour and not find the right tree. And then other times we can go in and instantly find a, a tree that's used. And the tree that we select um, has to be, if we reach our arms around and you can touch your arms on your elbow, that's as big as it can be. If we go too far, that means the tree's too small. If you can stretch your arms to the tips of them and you reach and you can't touch your arms behind the tree, then that will be too big. So it has to be within that person because if there's a tall person, they'd probably be able to reach around a bigger tree, but it's kind of an average um, a guesstimation. And well, not every tree is to be harvested from, and we only harvest on the north side of the tree, and we never um, harvest so much of the tree that we would kill it. Um, I have some pictures here also that I could share again of the tree that was um, harvested by my grandfather and the tree is still growing and that was over a hundred years ago. So. Here's a strip of bark. Yes, okay. So this is the inner cambium. So you can see the darker areas here. That's from the outside cambium, the outside bark of the tree that is retained within this one here. When it's dried, it's only about uh, two millimeters, maybe three millimeters um, thick. But when you wet it, it'll swell up. 
and then I can strip these all into eighth inch or quarter inch, sometimes even one sixteenth of an inch. And then once I strip those, then I'll use a needle and, and cut the pieces to make them thinner again until they're as thin as paper. Each one of my hats, um, the cedar that's on them, it has to be as thin as paper because you can't weave it when it's too coarse. It'll start to break. And this is red cedar here. So the word is which means red cedar or tree of life. Um, we do have a few yellow cedars more in the higher altitudes here, but there's not many, very many of those at all. So. Ardith has a great question. How do you know how much cedar you require for the coming season? Okay, good question. But um, I ran out of cedar one year, uh, probably about 2016, I think. Um, but um, knowing now that, um, uh, that I'm holding classes. I just held a class here about, when was it, uh, a week after the new year? So just, it was last week. We had uh, two groups in here, one with um, eight kids and then the other one was five kids. And so they were kids from a school in Nanaimo here and they came in and had a wonderful experience. So I'm always now um, holding on to some of the cedar and preparing it or having it prepared for these gatherings because we never know how many gatherings we're going to have, but having that extra cedar that's dried and ready is so important for us. Um, I'm a little bit leery myself of buying cedar from other people. There's some people will go out and harvest it, but don't do any harvest or any uh, weaving at all themselves. And I'm a little concerned about that because one of my cousins shared with me that she had a class that she was um, going to teach and she put all the cedar in the water and then all of a sudden these little um, bugs started floating to the surface and so there were she said there was maggots that were inside the cedar and so that cedar wasn't stored properly when it was first harvested and that's important to store it in a proper place where no bugs can get out of anything and we never store it inside plastic because plastic will make it mold right away so there's, there's so many um steps and procedures to follow that we um, have to be very cautious of it. And I have some cousins of mine here on our Snanemo Reserve that said they will never go harvest cedar because they're concerned for their life. And they don't feel that they come from a family that harvests cedar so that for that reason, they won't ever go out again or, or go out and harvest it. Whereas my family were weavers. My grandfather was a canoe carver and there's several trees on my land where the cedar had been pulled from. So I know I'm in the right line of doing it. So I hope that helps. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of uh, when I talked about being a clear mind and clear in your heart and being clean. What we're doing is not something out of a whim. We've been doing this our whole lives and our whole life revolves around the cedar tree. And that's why we consider ourselves arts collaborative because yeah. I work the inside of the cedar tree and Dave works the outside of the tree. And we're collaborating and learning each other's skills. I'm learning how to weave and Dave is learning how to work cedar. And um, it's, important. it's yeah, very important to share that knowledge. I'm just gonna grab something here. So on this photo here, I started as I was saying, I'm learning how to weave. You can see the weave that's underneath and this fish is sitting on. I made a similar piece still, it's quite, <laughs> um, but you would, a mat like this would be a little, quite a bit bigger, but a fish could be put on that. Yeah. So I have a few pictures I've shared before, and these are the ones I used even last week with the, the youth that were here. This is what a, a picture looks like of the tree where I've harvested the cedar. Is that, um, um, Carol, is that clear or is not? Yeah, okay, no, yeah. So what I do is I, after I peel the cedar from there and I separate it off and I clean it right there, you can see all the remains of the, the outside bark that I peeled off. And so after I um, clean it all up and get it ready, I roll it up inside out. And I was told to put it by the tree and then take a picture of that to show what location it is with um, my data on my phone. I can send a GPS location to our forestry, the Stenemo forestry office, and they have record of where I harvested from. The next picture is what the tree looks like 
10 years after. So this is on my family land. And I went there, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's the right way. Um, it's, um, I went there um, and collected the cedar. Probably can even go this way even. So. But I'm, I'm holding this, the side of the bark where I've peeled it from 10 years ago. And you can see it's starting to grow back now. It's starting to continue to close in. And then this is what it looks like 100 years later. My grandfather had collected a piece from here that he used uh, for a baler, for baling his canoe. And you can see it's almost closed back up. There's one more photo I have here of when I went out and, and looked at some of the trees on my land um, last year. And we could see this was where my grandfather had pulled uh, a strip of cedar from. So it's now completely healed back. And all that's left is a mark up on the top where the top of the piece was. So that's on my family land on the number two reserve in Snanemo here. And so it's kind of neat to have knowledge of this and then have photograph um, proof to show how the tree heals itself back. And that was how I was taught never to kill any of the trees. So. Artists would like to know, are there many others harvesting from Sunemu or are you the only one doing this? Good question, artist, but there's only a very few. I'm one of only six um, cedar weavers in Snanemo and we have 2000 members. Um, but some of your ancestors were harvesters also and weavers. I think we have even a picture of your great grandmother, Louisa um, um, Wesley, and she has a, a cedar basket with her. So there's some of the families here, the Snanemo were known as cedar weavers for hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years. So it's not um, something that we're brand new at it. So. Yeah, there's photos of that in the book. Oh, good. And then that other cedar book you had too had some good pictures in it. Yeah, so it's a real honor to have these kind of knowledge to um, pass on to people, but share. But like I shared earlier, it is we do encourage the people to learn about it, but um, learn it from a First Nations person, and don't feel that we can turn it around and go and do it on our own as a non-First Nations person, because it's um, the trees are being stressed by all the, um, the environment and whatnot and the bugs that are around here. So we really try to encourage people to um, respect the First Nations and leave this area specifically for them to work with. Um, but we're always hoping to um, host classes and teach people. I enjoyed the time I've um, done the work over on Gabriel and I'm hoping to continue this once this pandemic's passed and we can back and be back person to person again and we can host more classes again, so. Mm -hmm. This is a fish net, but there's also have, um, so that was all hand weaved. Woven, woven. Yeah. 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 Are there different types of weavers or do weavers weave hats and baskets and headbands and mats or do certain people weave certain things? Yes, good question. Um, I'm one that weaves hats. You can see all uh, several of my hats on display here. Um, there's other people that love to make roses and they're forever making bouquets of roses and that's where their strength is. Wherever where our strength is, in my area with we teaching classes like the one here I'm wearing with the, um, the indigo in it, um, it's adding something new to it, to what hasn't been done before, but finding a new way to uh, work with different cultures and whatnot. And um, that seems to be the area that I have the strength in doing. Because I used to be a teacher many years ago, I can um, step right back into that position with the cedar because it's something I feel is important to share our culture in a, in a good way with a good heart and that people will go away and feel that they've learned something, that they weren't just um, attending a class and not going away with something. Because in our culture, we're taught that when we take a class where we're weaving, um, we're not just there to learn it. We're there to learn it and be able to pass it on to other people who may need it in the future. So that's part of another part of it. It's kind of a twofold with our work that we do. Ardeth has a lovely thing to say. She says, the thing that I have learned about your work is your emphasis on being in a good place personally. 
it is obvious that your work is more than just the mechanical act of working with the cedar. Yeah. Awesome, Hi, Aishka. Thank you, artist. <laughs> That's awesome. Good yeah. words. She said she was going to come forward with some good questions or comments, and she did. <laughs> Very nicely done. Because it is true that our life has to be um, fully surrounded with it. We can't um, just uh, spare the moment. Even this morning coming in here, I had to do a circle around our shop here. And I'm glad that we get to have um, everyone see our shop here. This is where I teach my classes. And you can see the X's on the ground on the floor behind me that when we do have groups, the city of Nanaimo comes in and they each stand on the X's. So we're all two meters apart. And we do tours this way and we share um, to them so they can have an understanding of what we're doing here. So neat. Here's a just a quick photo of the different bowls. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's um there's a canoe bowl. Yeah, there's canoe bowls and there's uh, uh quick quag wolf bowls yeah, and yeah. Haida. It's like an otter. Yeah, and so all the way up. And so some of those are used for what they call creaser. Yeah, exactly. And so creaser oil, and that's a bear, is it bear fat or bear? Um, yeah, it would be the fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there's different, um, and then also the ladles that go with it. Yeah. Yeah, um, artist, this is called the Indian fishing. I could see the comment artist was asking. So there's the name of it, artist, and um, I have the older version, and Bo has a newer copy of it, of the same book. And so I was gift, gifted this book by uh, Bill White, and he asked me to go through it, study it, and uh, start recreating some of these items so that I can um, get strength in that and have more knowledge and and uh, some of the teachings that I've already received. And so it was, um, I had never seen this book before, so it was quite, um, I was shocked to see some of the stories that are within it that they talk about. Um, canoes all traveling together up and down the Salish Sea and stopping at each village site. And along each village site, as they were going, they're collecting fishing and harvesting, not just fish, but berries and shellfish. And um, every person had a job to do. And uh, at one time, almost 500 canoes were all traveling together. And they stopped in Sanemo and had a an enormous potlatch. And so it was quite uh, amazing to see that they had um, that many canoes and that many people all working together as one. And there wasn't, um, they were fighting with one or another. And then every, um, Papa Bill White will bring up um, the white picket fence idea and how the co colonization they brought that how everything is uh, individual and separated. But in that time, all the shellfish, the berries and the land and the trees and the animals were all relatives. My papa would say, look down the beach now, what do you see? I'd say, oh, I don't know, papa, what do I, m I just see some children playing. He said, awa, those are your children. And so when we'd walk the forest, He'd say, look at all those trees and those animals and plants. What do you see? He said, oh, we're in a forest, Papa. He said, awa, those are all your relatives. And so I carry those teachings forwards and I try to relay his words uh, for the next generation to hear. And so that was part of my teachings is that it was, it's my turn now to carry that now that he is he's passed and so yeah it's a little bit of um our connection we don't just um shoot an animal um just for the fun of it we're when we take an animal's life we try to use all of those parts like i was saying when we harvested all those fish we used the head we used uh, as much as we could and what we couldn't use we put it back in the ocean and this, the dog salmon would come up and they would just have this enormous feast and it was feeding all walks of life. And so it was um, really, really powerful and really good um, 
really good teachings and old teachings that are as old as time itself. And so, yeah. And we also use a lot of those words in everyday, our everyday life now that we um, still say um, it takes a whole community to raise a child. And those are things that we always believe that everyone has a role to play in the community. And for each person to feel that they, um, they, they, some of them will know what their role is as soon as it comes about to, to them. Others, they spend their entire life not knowing and um, trying to find what their role is. But it looks like I found my role. What my role is to do is to do work and teaching and uh, give, um, give some knowledge that I've been gifted with from my elders and pass that on to people, which is so important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any final questions for Dave and Bo this afternoon? That was a lot of information, a lot of good information. <laughs> yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> and Dave, if you could just come into the frame a little bit so we can see yes, your mm -hmm. hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Awesome. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Mar says, thank you so much. Antoinette says, thank you so much. Yes. Hi, Chica. And, Chica. Hi, Chica. and uh, the Arts Council would like to virtually present mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Yes. Thank uh, you, yeah, yeah. Dave. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And Bo as well. Our appreciation. Thank you very much awesome. for this presentation and for joining us. We've really enjoyed these sessions. Artist says, great to see you guys again. And Frida, much gratitude for sharing your stories. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll, there will be another presentation next Monday. Uh, same link, same Zoom link, and you can attend. And uh, it will be Dave bodily and bill white good, so good. everyone have a great afternoon awesome good awesome. thank you good, good.